Oh hell internet, this is a book review of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Persig and it will be in three parts. First I will give my personal opinion on the book and go into some of the themes in a largely spoiler free way. Then there will be a spoiler section where I will explain how the plot affects some of those themes. And then finally I will discuss some of the philosophical implications that I am left with. Although this will be strictly surface level, I will not be making any rigorous philosophical claims here. I won't bury the lead, this is a 10 out of 10 book. It is not perfect, but then nothing is, and even those places where it falls down slightly are interesting. But it is regarded as a modern classic. Everyone who has even a passing interest in philosophy should read it, although if you are very much against philosophy then it's probably not going to be for you. It is not overly technical however, and is quite accessible to any audience of readers. As some have noted, the title is something of a misnomer. It is ultimately not really about Zen and not really about motorcycle maintenance, although both will make an appearance in the course of the book. The framing of the story is autobiographical. Persig casts himself as the narrator in first person, who is on a motorcycle holiday with his 12-year-old son Chris and their friends John and Sylvia across the northern states of the US. This was a true event, although I'm sure some narrative liberties have been taken. The various places and people they encounter along the way speak to the problem that Persig is considering through the philosophical sections of the book, the strange disconnect between the modern world and human happiness that seems to have emerged, what Arendt might have called world alienation. Persig, as an amateur motorcycle mechanic, makes clear that he is in favour of modern technology, but like Arendt, he is deeply ambivalent about the place that we have come to in modernity. He expands on this through his distinction between classic and romantic modes of life, and although he, in contrast to John and Sylvia, ostensibly places himself on the classic side, there is, as emerges towards the end of the first part, more to him than meets the eye. Persig casts his philosophical musings as a Chautauqua, referring to the popular 19th and 20th century movement in the US that encouraged adult education. These took various forms and, unsurprisingly, there were conflicting ideas of what a true Chautauqua consists of. The word itself is Native American in origin, from the Iroquois tribe, possibly meaning a pair of moccasins tied together, a bag tied in the middle, or a place where fish have been caught. Based on these different possibilities, I could speculate on why the name was chosen, but I would be completely guessing. So if you happen to be a scholar of education and Iroquois culture, then please jump into the comments. Regardless, Persig takes us through a syllabus of important concepts that are derived from his previous experiences, from the classic romantic distinction, the scientific method, the idea of quality, through to energetic motivation, for which he uses the folksy word gumption. Real-world figures come into his Chautauqua, and I was frequently reminded of Sophie's World as a modern example of the style, although the latter book does divide itself more starkly between philosophical essays and narrative framing devices. Throughout the Chautauqua, we also get accounts of the life of a man referred to as Phaedrus, who the narrator seems to regard with a deep suspicion. With regard to the philosophy, Persig speaks with confidence, but he is not a scholar and he does not have the deepest appreciation for some of the technical nuances, much like myself to be very, very clear. But this is much to the book's benefit, I feel, as even when the discussion is purely philosophical, there is still a narrative and an opinion, and the level of prose remains relatively down to earth. I'm sure that real philosophers could pick apart his opinions on Plato, Aristotle, Kant, and the others, but I'm equally sure that Persig knew this as he wrote those opinions down. Moving into some slight philosophical spoilers now, the philosophical goal of the book is against the platonic dominance of the philosophical space and the classical edifice of thought which it developed, and Persig is happy to make this claim in spite of the huge successes of science and technology which ultimately came out of it. He identifies quality as something unique and spontaneous, an aspect of reality which can only be appreciated in real time and cannot be captured in an abstract framework of ideas. This is why Persig ultimately stands with the sophists against Plato, with certain asterisks as we shall see in the spoiler section. 
Unfortunately, he does not clearly identify what quality is as a concept, and indeed, he specifically says that it must not be defined. He links it at various times with different things, its practical namesake quality in work, the Greek concept of arete, which is itself somewhat nebulous, being variously interpreted as virtue, excellence or goodness, and with the Eastern Tao, which is itself inherently undefinable. As you might expect, though, with my Taoist leanings, I have considerable sympathy for the position that Persig describes. I am fully aware of the problems of interpreting science in the modern age, in particular the way that it affects normal human lives. See my essay on Arendt's The Conquest of Space and the Statue of Mankind. However, I am hesitant to side with Persig's attacks on Plato. But then, on the other hand, so is Persig. And this is where we get into spoilers, so if you think you might want to go into the book relatively blind, then you should stop watching here. The big secret about Persig's narrator, and the reason why we must be so ambivalent in regard to his true perspective, is that he had a nervous breakdown earlier in his life, and then in fact, Phaedrus is the narrator himself prior to being hospitalized and treated with electroshock therapy. His son Chris was aged six at the time, and so the reason for their strained relationship is the constant sense that Chris experiences a lingering pain for the father that he lost and a resentment for the imposter that has replaced him, sensing with childlike clarity what Persig admits later in the book. I am a heretic who has recanted, and so, in everyone's eyes, has saved his soul. Everyone's eyes but one who understands that all he has saved is his skin. The Chautauqua, and indeed the whole motorcycle trip, is initially presented as being for the reader, but it becomes clear that it is in fact the narrator's attempt to contextualize and put together the fragments that he remembers of Phaedrus' life, and the philosophical project that ultimately doomed him. Persig is steeped in American pragmatism and the analytic tradition, so it is perhaps unsurprising that the name of Nietzsche never comes up, but there is definitely a pathos that is reminiscent of that much maligned German philosopher and his nobly meant but ultimately self-destructive path. This also speaks to another aspect of the narrator, the fact that he is, by virtue of his self-absorbed project, not the best father to Chris. This is not to say that he is terrible, nor that he does not try, nor even that Phaedrus was a better father, although Chris certainly thinks so. But there is a disconnect between them that he is unable to cross and unable to understand. In spite of the fact that it keeps him isolated, he hopes somehow that the Chautauqua will help him to find a way to reconnect. He is right about this, but not in the way that he might have wished. As the book continues, they travel to different places and meet various people, including some old acquaintances of Phaedrus, who the narrator needs to pretend that he remembers, calling upon his few remaining memories to enable this subterfuge. Eventually, John and Sylvia leave them to continue alone, and the relationship between the narrator and Chris continues to be volatile. At one point, they visit a school where Phaedrus used to teach, and it is about this time that the Chautauqua begins to discuss the task that Phaedrus set for himself, identifying quality, the underlying essence of all human experience, in opposition to the so-called Church of Reason, which is essentially the edifice of science and technology which has grown out of the basis of Platonic philosophy and the domination of the Vita Contemplativa, as described by Arendt. As I said, I'm not going to try and draw out all the details in this video, but the journey begins to take a darker turn when he and Chris climb a mountain together, and the narrator has a dream about being trapped behind a glass door, with Chris attempting to call out to him to come back. He wants to open the door to get to Chris, but is prevented by a shadowy figure that blocks him, but also fears him. The narrator mistakes this dream for a memory of being in the mental hospital, but the reader is meant to discern that something else is happening. Phaedrus is stirring, and wants to meet Chris at the top of the mountain. The narrator subconsciously recognizes this danger, but transposes it into a fear of rockfalls, and he convinces, or rather browbeats, Chris into turning back before they reach the summit. They continue the journey, but the dam has begun to break. We continue through Phaedrus' story as he pits himself somewhat arrogantly against the scientific and academic establishment, and it is Phaedrus, rather than the narrator, who sides with the sophists against Plato. The narrator remains ambivalent. However, in the final chapters, when Phaedrus has his apparent moment of victory, it is immediately followed by a sense of hollowness and a break with reality which leaves him hospitalized. But the Chautauqua has reawakened him, and in the recurring dream one night, he leaps upon the shadowy figure who blocks the door and reveals it to be himself, the narrator. 
From here, the narrator begins to lose control, and at the end of the book, much to Chris's delight, it seems as though Phaedrus has fully re-emerged, although it is also hinted that some kind of synthesis has taken place. Moving on to the philosophy of the book, it seems to me as though Phaedrus was led to support rhetoric because it seemed to him to be somehow vital and immediate, which fit with his sense of quality as being the Tao which sits prior to both the romantic and classical aspects of human life. He specifically says that quality is to be left undefined, but that permits him a wide margin for rhetorical trickery, which is exactly what Plato saw as being the problem with the sophists in the first place. When Persig refers to the Platonic dialogue, the Gorgias, he has Phaedrus scoff at Socrates' slippery argumentation in getting the better of the exchange. And fair enough on that, remember that Plato was writing both sides here. But he says nothing of Callicles, Polus, and even Gorgias himself expressing pleasure at the power over men that rhetoric allows, explicitly excluding truth or virtue, or redefining them in purely selfish terms. I'm sure that Persig's Phaedrus would not support this use of rhetoric, but he never even addresses it. That said, I sympathize with the idea that the world has indeed gone too far down the classical route of Platonic thought. The Vita Contemplativa has its limits, which is why Arendt spent such efforts to expand on the Vita Activa in response. This reconnection with the world is something that Phaedrus did not seem to consider, which is why he ultimately came to realize that his efforts were self-defeating in his own terms. In arguing for rhetoric, he had implicitly broken his cardinal rule not to define quality, and he could see no way out of this mental cul-de-sac. The namesake of Phaedrus is also mentioned, Socrates' interlocutor in another one of the Platonic dialogues, the Phaedrus. And for my money, this one is not given nearly enough ink. Persig himself admits to a mistake in translating Phaedrus as wolf, because this name in fact belongs to the rhetorician Lysias. Phaedrus, rather, means brilliant. As Persig says himself, this could have been a much worse metaphor, but there are nonetheless some misunderstandings which are caused by this mistake. When he does mention the Platonic Phaedrus, it is in somewhat disparaging terms, calling him not very bright, in direct contradiction of his name, and he says that he is dangerous due to his willingness to threaten violence. I think that this is the mistranslation affecting his reading of the text, as when Phaedrus does threaten Socrates, it is in an altogether playful, almost flirtatious manner, and he immediately pulls back to the more effective strategy of withholding from Socrates his beloved discourse. The Platonic Phaedrus is no more dull-witted than many of the other people that Socrates converses with. All of Plato's dialogues often come down to Socrates posing questions to forward a position, and then people agreeing with him until they actually agree with contradictory statements. This is a bit of an oversimplification, but by and large this seems to be what happens. But Phaedrus the Brilliant represents a muse of sorts for Socrates in his attempt to first argue on behalf of the non-lover, and then against, then define the soul, and finally decide whether rhetoric is an art at all. To finish off this very brief philosophical review, I want to turn to chapter 18, where Persig's Phaedrus attacks the squares as part of the classical church of reason. He identifies squareness as what is left when quality is removed, with a tongue-in-cheek allusion to the colloquial idea of scientists as squares as against the more artistic type of person. As the narrator affirms, classical and romantic are both integral to the world, but Phaedrus tends to lean harder towards the romantic side in his opposition to the domination of the classical. On occasions like this, he seems to be categorizing quality as a romantic aspect, but he does eventually settle on it as being prior to both. So what is Phaedrus' quality? Time for a visual metaphor. If we take Phaedrus at his word and place squareness on the classical side of the world, then what shall we put on the romantic side? It seems appropriate to use a circle in recognition of the famous problem that is being mirrored here. Side note, I was going to suggest that no technical knowledge is required to draw a circle, whereas some measurements of length and angle are needed to draw a square, but I'm not sure that this strictly holds up. You can make a circle with only a fixed point and a fixed length, but to make a square, the only additional information you need is the ability to recognize a right angle, which is not necessarily a measurement. It is a more involved process than the inscribing of a circle, but I don't think it's necessarily fair to say that there is a bright line in the level of technical expertise required. With that caveat in mind, it is nonetheless fair to state that there is something specifically man-made about a square which does not reliably appear in the natural world, the only notable exceptions being perhaps certain crystalline structures which were actually the spark for early geometric investigations. So how then do we square the circle? 
Phaedrus claimed that quality was something that you could just see and that it was prior to anything classic or romantic and could not be captured therefore by the church of reason. Quality pertains to both of these models in the way that we can perceive them. Whether we are dealing with a circle or a square, you can look at a shape and you can just know within the limits of your human perception if it fits the criteria or not. This is a circle and this isn't. This is a square and this isn't. We do not need to refer to the strict definition of either to make our immediate human judgment. This is a metaphor for how Persig's Phaedrus appears to view quality. But there I will leave it and ask you, the viewer, to give your opinions. What did you think of Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance? Which of the positions did you identify with most? And what do you think of my perspectives as given here? If you haven't read the book and you are still listening, then I can still recommend that you give it a go. After all, the journey is the destination. Thanks for listening and bye for now.